friends, Jerry Rosa here in the Rosa String Works workshop, getting ready to start another major build. We're going to be using this gorgeous block of quilted maple. And this comes from the Pacific Northwest, I believe. If I'm not mistaken, it comes from somewhere around like Oregon, Washington, places like that. I actually just bought these slabs sight unseen off of eBay. That's where I got them. I don't normally buy wood like that, but they had a lot of good close-up pictures of it, and I've, you know, bought enough wood in my life to know quality wood when I see it. And when a piece like this comes up for sale in a large block, and you just pay the price, and I was going to pay the price regardless where the bid went. Well, I say regardless, but I mean, if it had got up to $1,000, no, I don't think I would have paid that, but I was willing to pay up to say around $300 for this piece. And I don't remember what I got it for, but I think it was less than that. So anyway, it's been sitting on the shelf here acclimating for, oh, six months to, and maybe longer than that now, maybe eight or nine months. So it's ready to be used in a build, and that's ex exactly what we're doing. We have a customer that wanted me to use the quilted maple for his mandolin, and I'm excited to do that. This will be the first one I've built from this material. Now, the positives and negatives. I pretty much knew when I bought this, this was not what you call quarter sawn. Well, actually, in this regard, you could kind of say it's quarter sawn, but that's the wrong way. You would prefer to have it quarter sawn this way. However, the back is not as important in terms of sound for an instrument. I've always said the top is at least 80% of your sound. Your back and sides help in that the hardness reflects the sound back to throughout the sound holes. Uh, especially in a mandolin. It's like a percussion thing and it bounces the sound back out the sound hole. A little different on a violin in that it actually does vibrate because of the bowing action. The back does vibrate on a mandolin too, don't get me wrong. It's just that it's more of a percussive uh, role in a mandolin. Many people actually tell me that they prefer to use slabs on wood anyway in, uh, on the backs and sides of instruments. Um, so it'll be the first time I've actually used the slabs on wood, to be perfectly honest with you. But because of the uh, quality of the grain pattern in this, it's worth the try. And I believe that I can make it a wonderful sound in mandolin with this and perhaps even better, you just never know until you do it. So what I've done first is I've, because this is such a thick block, I'm gonna to have to slice pieces out of it. And I have determined that the size of the slice I want to make is exactly 600 thousandths of an inch. So I'm gonna slice two pieces out of this 600 thousandths of an inch. That should leave us with plenty of material left to make the sides out of, and possibly even the neck out of. So I think we'll be in good shape. So here we go. I've got the saw all set up to make my 600 thousandths of an inch cut. And nothing like being too safe, so let me double check that just to be sure. So you can see I've got my caliper set at 600 thousandths of an inch. And I can slide it right in there. And that should actually give me a little bit of waste, so I should be fine. If you're trying to figure out that out in millimeters, just divide the 600 by 40 and you'll be real close. Here's the millimeters right here. It's, one, it's roughly 1 1.5 centimeters.
this is a little bit like Christmas, as you can see here. I have not opened it up yet. I uh, know what I'm going to get. It's like a present deal. I'm hoping that the grain's going to be beautiful on the inside of this piece, but you just never know. Anyway, I'm about ready to open it up here to see what we ended up with. Uh, one thing I can tell you with this wood not being quarter sawn, the further you carve it, the less the design will match because it goes further away from the surface design. And right now, it's beautiful. I'll take that, it looks great. So we've got to do this whole process again, make one more slab, and I'll show you what that looks like when I'm finished. It's difficult to judge size on camera, and so I've got my template here so that you can better judge how big this piece is. I only have to make half of the back out of this piece and half of the back out of the other piece. So it is big enough. And what I'm trying to do now is optimize the grain pattern, you know, to decide where I want the pattern and, and how to cut it, because I am going to have to cut it again. And I don't know, it's really hard to say. It's really pretty all over. Probably. I guess I can make that decision after I saw it again, and that's probably what I'll do, is I'll just go ahead and saw this and make the decision on that part later. So what I have to do is decide where do I want to cut a straight line. Now, I want to cut that straight line straight through both of these pieces so that the grain orientation will still be matched up. I could have done that before I sliced it, but then I would have been cutting this big extra piece also, and I didn't really want to do that. So that's why I chose to do it this way. So I'm basically just needing a straight line to start the process here. And, uh, you know, it never seems to work on camera. Can't even get my mechanical pencil to work. There we go. Try that again. There you go. So that'll be my straight line that I'll work off. That'll be the center line of the mandolin more than likely. Although I won't even decide that till after I make that cut. But right now, we're gonna go back over there and slice through both of these pieces and make that straight cut. Well, I've sliced that edge off now and so, you know, these pieces were together in the tree like this. You open them up and now these two pieces are basically book matched as I mentioned when I was getting ready to saw some of this that the thing is they're relatively book matched but on slab sawn wood it won't stay totally book matched as you carve down the grain will change more because of the fact that it's not quarter sawn but you know that's just part of it I can't help that you know it's the way the board was sawn so I can't change that so the only thing I can change at the moment is which end of this should I use. And I gotta be honest, it's really hard to choose. Uh, both ends are really nice. I think there's a bit more curl down here. That's just my feeling. So I'm gonna use this end. It's kind of six and one half, half a dozen the other. So it's, it's just an arbitrary choice at this point. So this is the one I'm going to use. And I'm going to just, for my own benefit, so I don't mix this up, I'm just gonna just trace around this real quick with the pencil. That way I'll make sure to keep it all oriented the same in case I move things around. Don't really care about that right now. I'll redraw that later, but that way I'll know this part goes together face up like that. And, yeah, I think that's gonna work out really nice. So, the first thing I gotta do now is join these two boards together. And I think before I actually join them together, I think I'm just gonna go ahead and saw this off arbitrarily across here, just so that I'm working with a shorter board. You know, the rest of this is gonna be waste pretty much. And I'll have these extra two links here that I can do something with down the road. Um, but I think I will just arbitrarily saw it in half right there. Well, we're about ready to put the glue on these two parts. Squeeze a little bit on here and then spread it around.
as I always say, you want full coverage on your glue. This is a very important glue joint because it's the strength of your whole back. So you want to make sure you get really good coverage. I've already held the joint up to the light and can't see any light through it. So it's ready to, to go together. I think I've made up my mind that I like these glue applicators for anything that's a big flat joint. On anything irregular, I like the paintbrush better. Now that I have the center seam closed and some pressure on it, I'm putting these two broad C-clamps right on the joint itself. Since these both of these boards are flat, it's easy to put the C-clamps right on there and keep that seam perfect. That way the seam can't float up and down like this, which they like to do. Any flat surface loves to float like that. And now I can put a little more pressure on it with these clamps. And then I can also put this clamp on through the center the opposite direction. It's important that with these pipe clamps you put some from the bottom, some from the top. It helps keeps the pressure a little straighter, a little, little more flat or a little more even, however you want to look at it. That's just about as perfect of squeeze out as you could ever expect to find anywhere, the way that turned out. Let's see if I can zoom in and let you see that a little bit. Hopefully you can see it. I'll hold it up here a little bit for you so you can see the squeeze out. It's almost perfectly even all the way across the top. It's going to be a beautiful I say top, it's a, it's a back, obviously. But uh, anyway, uh, it's all the way across that uh, joint and it's perfect. Uh, everything's even flat. All we have to do now is wait and then we can get started on it probably late this afternoon or tomorrow. Well, my friends, on this mandolin build, I selected a very high grade piece of spruce. If you'd find a piece of spruce with the grain any straighter than that, I want to see it. Because that there is just like a ruler. I mean, it's just like a straight edge going down through there. It doesn't have a quiver in it anywhere. It's just as straight as it can be. And I've worked on the joint here. I'm holding it up to a bright window light right behind the camera. And I cannot see any daylight coming through the joint whatsoever. So... I guess perfect is good enough. That's maybe another t-shirt down the road. Yeah, I guess perfect is good enough. So, yeah, it's really, I don't think you can get one any tighter than the way that fits up. Sorry about the camera going dark whenever I hold that up there. It's such light colored wood, the camera decides that it needs to shut down the aperture somewhat I guess anyway gonna glue this together right now Things have been drying clamped up for about three hours and I have taken them out and I'm going to saw out the profile now and of course it's one last chance to double check that I didn't mess up and what I do is put them back to back and go yep that's the top and that's the back and that looks right to me so there you go I think it's time to cut them out it's now or never
show the routing this time, but you can see I have routed an edge around here. I just do it freehand. You can go in, oh, three quarters of an inch without any fear at all. I only went in maybe five eighths or a half inch or a little more in places. But uh, you can go in quite a ways without any problem because your top domes, it comes down and it comes back up. My goal is to leave a, a roughly a quarter inch of wood on this outside edge. And that'll actually come down a little bit later too. But that gives me something to carve to. The way I do it is I keep the top at a certain spot and I carve everything down and then around to those edges. And that helps me carve more symmetrically. So we're ready to start the carving process now. Well, my friends, I haven't got all this on camera. I have had so many interruptions working on this, but you can see I did get that routed out around there on both of these parts. And then I took the angle grinder with that little rasp. It's just a round circular rasp. And I rasp off some of the excess wood around the edges here. I don't try to get it very close with that because it's just too dangerous to, uh, you could just ruin the wood. So I, anyway, I just knock off a certain amount of bulk. And then, then I start in with the uh, finger planes. And this little palm plane is really nice that one of my wonderful viewers sent me. And I sharpened this up really good. And so right now, this these little palm planes, you know, a person could do a lot of detail with these. I just use these for roughing out, just, just to hog the wood off and get rid of the bulk. And then once I get down to the detail, then I'll switch over to the actual finger plane. Because to me, I feel like I'm right there on the detail that way. I feel like you're a little further removed from your detail this way. Though if you practice with it, I'm sure you could carve the detail with this too. But this is a wonderful little plane. It doesn't hurt your fingers at all to use it. You can just go with this thing. You can go with this almost all day long, I think. Well, I'm not going to show a ton of that because it's just more of that. It's just really several hours of just carving like this. And yes, I know there are all kinds of ways to do it with machines and ways to do it faster. But what would be the fun in that? This is the way I like to do it. I like to carve them by hand. And that's why I do it this way. And that's what they're paying for. They're paying me the big bucks to uh, suffer, and so I'm suffering. My friends, I'm not sure when the last update was on this, but you can tell that it's in pretty good shape. It's not been sanded, but it has pretty much been carved on the outside. So it's in pretty good shape. One of the tests that I do is look at like this and look, check the symmetry across the top. And I also check it this way and look at it in the profile and can see that it's in pretty good shape. I don't feel like I ever get it completely carved perfectly on the outside until I start carving the inside. But I always try to get it as close as I think I can get it, you know, on the, on the outside before I start the inside. It gives me something to carve to, you know. And right now it's in, in pretty good shape. I'll probably work on it a little bit more before I get into it. You know, and considering all the interruptions I've had over the last two or three days, it's a miracle I've even gotten this far. Uh, we've had uh, everything from customers who uh, wanted to pay extra and wait while they, I fix their instrument to kidney stones and uh, eye doctor visits to dig steel out of my eyes. So, I mean, every, every kind of interruption you can imagine. <laughs> it's amazing I'm even this far. Yeah, and that eye is pretty, pretty tired right now. If I, I got to thinking, I told Caleb, I said, I really missed the boat. I said, over the last, you know, 15, 20 years, if I'd have collected all the stuff they've dug out of my eyes, I could be going to the, uh, 
you know, to the uh, recycling center and making some money. But uh, I didn't think that far ahead, you know. Anyway, um, it's looking pretty good. The uh, back hasn't gotten much further. I do have the back knocked down a little bit, but I haven't actually started carving the back. I think I'll go ahead and since I'm this far on the top, I think I'll go ahead and carve the inside of the top before I actually get started on the back. Part of the reason for that is the back's much harder to carve. This kind of toughens up your fingers, believe it or not, so that you can do a better job on the back. That's at least that's always been my theory and you do it over several days and you you build up calluses and your fingers get tougher. My biggest problem this time around is definitely the carpal tunnel and the arthritis. But I'm finding a way through it right now so we'll we'll get there eventually. Getting ready to bend the sides for this mandolin and this side here is okay, it's pretty, but this side here is much prettier. So I'm going to start at the tail pin and I'm going to work my way around to the scroll. That way the best part of this wood will be on the top of the mandolin where you can see it. And I've never done it that way before. I've always worked from the scroll backward, but this time I'm going to work from the back point to the scroll just so I can make sure this winds up where I want it. So here we go. That is some gorgeous figure in that wood. I don't know if it's showing up, but it is gorgeous. It's going to really be pretty. I've never tried to bend quilted maple before. This is my very first attempt, so I don't know what to expect. I'm hoping it bends okay. I can already see that it's kind of folding in certain places, which I was not hoping for that. So let's See if we can keep it smooth. It bends easy. As far as bending goes, it bends easy, but it does want to kink at these ripples. So you got to be careful with that it looks like. It's holding shape pretty well. Yeah, it's, it's bending pretty good. It's a little kinky looking. I hope this area up here doesn't have as much of that in it because it's going to be difficult to bend that tight of a bend around that scroll with this quilted stuff, I can tell. So I'm hoping that I've made the right choice here, putting all the quilted part out in the plain area. Well, that was great, except I bent it in the wrong place entirely. Compared to curly maple, this stuff bends like a dream. The only problem is I keep bending it in the wrong place. I was driving down a lonely road on a dark and stormy night When a little girl by the roadside now that I'm making the other long side, I'll make sure that this highly figured wood falls in the best location as well. Up in my headline, I stopped, she crawled in the back, and in a shaky tone, she said, my name is Mary, please won't you take me home? She must have been so frightened. Long there in the night There was something strange about her Her face was deadly white She sat there pale and quiet In the back seat all alone I never will forget that night I took Mary home
So that's what it ended up with. All bent up. That stuff bends very nicely. Really does bend well. It does kink a little bit, tend to, but it doesn't seem to break. It just kinks at the different, you know, pattern lines or whatever. But if you're careful with it, it's not hard to bend that stuff at all. The New York mandolin is coming along really well. I think I've got it pretty much finished on the carving. And I always say pretty much because, you know, I like to let them set a day or two, go back to them and really get particular. Um, you know, there's no better time to make sure it's right than right now. So I think though I will just let it set away uh, and just kind of sit on the shelf while I work on carving this quilted maple. This will be the first quilted maple that I've actually hand carved. So here we go. Hopefully it will carve with uh, this palm plane, but uh, there's no guarantee of that because of the hardness of the maple. These take a little bigger bite and you know, I'm gonna have to learn the characteristics of this and, and feel which way it wants to be carved. And so far it doesn't. So let me take a less bite here, take the really shallow bite and see how that's going to work, if it's going to work. Looks like the angle cut is probably the way I'm going to have to carve it. Yeah, that's definitely waking up the grain. It is working. And this is going to be slow, but this is better for my fingers with the carpal tunnel. So this is going to work better. Well, I guess uh, the vote is in here. It uh, doesn't carve too bad. You can't carve it in certain directions. It's, it seems like it wants to be carved at a 45 to the length if you're carving at least in a 45 to the length, it seems to be carving pretty well. So you can see I've got tons of that to do. So I'll get with it and show you the progress as we get along. The top carved so easy, I didn't feel I needed this bench hook. For those of you who may not be familiar, there's just a sharp edge on this, and you just lay it over the top of the edge of the bench, and, it, and you can push against this, and it's, you know, it gives you something to push against. And the, I didn't feel I needed it on the top at all. The top carved very easy, but this is carving much harder, so it just gives you something to push against, and it doesn't give, and therefore the cutter does a better job. And that's really about all it amounts to. It's better than using a clamp and locking it down because you have to continually turn this as you carve it. Well, the grain probably isn't showing up that well yet because it's rough, but you can start to see the curl and the different things. It winks at you as I move it around. It's gonna be beautiful. I'll show you more later. I bought some uh, more or less cheap gouges off of, uh, I don't know, eBay or somewhere. I can't remember now. And these are not the two cherries quality, I'll just tell you. But they seem to be working pretty well. I don't use gouges all that much, so, but I thought, well, I'll go ahead and just get a set of them because I only had one real decent gouge and I wasn't really impressed with it. So this set beats what I had. Can't really speak to it too much. I'm sure it's, you know, probably made in China or somewhere, but it seems to hold an edge fairly well. Seems to work pretty well. There's no name on the brand that I know of here. Anyway, um, I had made this years ago. This seriously was just a piece of firewood and I just took a draw knife and I saw it around here first and then just chiseled off everything I didn't need for a hammer. You can see it's been well used over the years. I probably made this at least 30 years ago and been using it ever since. The advantage of a large hammer like this is that it's got such a heavy head, you don't have to hit very hard. 
number one. Number two, it's got such a big head, you don't have to be looking at this and knowing you're going to hit it. You can be watching the point and tapping this and cutting real easily and don't have to worry about it. And the, the fact that it's so big and heavy, the inertia drives it through the wood really easily. So if you're needing to do a lot of chiseling, I recommend a mallet like this or a maul or whatever you want to refer to it as, carving hammer. Now this is a tricky part to carve and especially now that this is a new type of wood that I'm carving, I want to be very careful that I don't get too deep here on this end and chip out the whole end. This is the little tang that goes over the heel of the neck. So as I carve down to that, I, I'm taking very light uh, cuts and more or less sneaking up on it because, boy, you can really ruin your instrument quickly if you do something, you know, if you just take too much wood. If you get greedy and try to carve too much at once, it's not a good idea. Even that chipped out a pretty big chip, so I got to be careful. Again, carving at this 45 degree angle is far superior than going straight with the grain because it doesn't chip out nearly as badly. So wherever possible, I'm trying to carve it at the angle. Carves much better. You know, not to beat it to death, but there's a very noticeable difference carving at an angle as opposed to carving straight. It chips out really badly carving it straight carving it at an angle, there's no chip out at all. I don't know if you can really see the difference very well, probably not, but here you can see the, the cuts are really smooth going this way at the angle. Right here where I was going straight, it chipped out a big chunk. It chipped out big chunks right here and right here going straight. So angle is far superior. Well, I'm going to finish carving this and then I'll show you what it looks like. My friends, you've probably been to a gender reveal party or at least heard of them or seen one. We're going to kind of have a reveal party here right now of a different sort. This is going to be a grain reveal party, or at least I hope it is. I've got this wet towel and I'm going to wipe this down before the camera and let you see the grain in this thing because I think it's going to be beautiful. I don't really know until I wipe it down. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I'd say it's everything I was hoping for and then maybe some on top of that. Look at that. Ain't that purdy? <laughs> that is really nice. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> that is really something. Yeah, and it's really book matched. I am so impressed with the book match part. I wouldn't have given you 10 cents for that. I would have thought, no, nah, it isn't going to be book matched at all. And the reason is that this piece of wood wasn't quarter sawn this way. It was quarter sawn this way, if anything. So when you open that up and split it, it typically doesn't match. This matches almost perfectly. I mean, in fact, it may be the best book matched in terms of the grain pattern itself that I've ever seen. I mean, it's really book matched. Now, I, I'm talking the curl, not the, the grain and the curl is two different things. And really, I'm talking the curl is what's matching. The grain itself, these fine lines don't match. And I knew they wouldn't. But the curl, the quilting part, if you want to call it quilting versus curl in this case, the quilting matches really well, as you can see. I mean, the same design is on both sides, and it's just really cool. It's just awesome. Yeah, if that doesn't stain up to be the prettiest mandolin in the whole world, I don't know what will. That is just gorgeous. Friends, I've carved a lot of wood in my 40 years of doing this, but I haven't run into anything that likes to tear out more than this wood does. I've been using all the different finger planes and tools that I have, including scrapers and everything. And everything, including the freshly sharpened scraper, and this baby is sharp, let me tell you, even that causes tear out. 
And I'm thinking, how am I gonna get past that? Cause it's too much sanding to do by hand to try to clean that up. It's really a lot. In steps Colin. Old Colin sent me this quite a while back and I've used it a lot, don't get me wrong, but I just found the really nice use for this thing. This thing, it got rid of all those humps and tear outs and, and what I did was, and I'll just show you my technique, I held it like this and I just did this and I just rolled it around like this and you keep it moving because if you don't keep it moving, it'll dig a hole in a heartbeat. So I just, you know, very lightly kept it moving like this and just and, and kept this thing rocking and, you know, it just made a beautiful job on this. Got rid of all the tear out. You know, I always carve this area here and bring it down. Still, it's kind of all at the same level right now, so I'm going to bring this peak down and come down into the top better. So I'll just show you a little bit of using this with that technique here and uh, you'll see what I'm doing. Pulled into the driveway where she told me to go I got out to help her from the car then I opened up the door But I just could not believe my eyes Well you can probably see what I was doing there and I tell you what that did a really nice job just a really nice job and it made it a lot smoother you can probably see the grain in the uh, the curl or figure in the wood a lot better now so that really is pleasing to me man I was getting so much tear out it's unbelievable now I'm gonna you know really get down to the fine detail feeling it around with my hands and you know any place I feel any kind of lumps or anything that's not just perfect I can still take the scraper and get rid of those little tiny spots just little tiny spots now that's a lot better than scraping the whole thing and getting all that tear out and I was getting a ton of tear out it was just the most I believe I ever got on any piece of wood yeah the sander definitely saved me on that one thank you Colin yeah that's real nice I barely even feel anything now it's amazing how accurate you can use that thing if you put your mind to it you know you could also screw it up in a heartbeat if you're not careful very nice really really nice I'm gonna give it a little more thought and look it over really close before I go to the inside I always like to try to get the outside as close as I can before I go to the inside and I'm just about ready to turn it over and start there I believe I've been carving on this well, I actually, it's the next day since the last time you saw this video, but I was carving on this yesterday afternoon for quite a long time. I've got a pretty good bowl in there now, as you might be able to see, but I have come to the conclusion that this stuff is much more difficult to carve, and it's not because of the hardness. The, in fact, this wood is softer than the normal typical curly maple or the bird's eye maple that I've carved in the past, either of those is much harder than this wood is, I think. The problem with this to make it, that makes it more difficult to carve is that it tears out really a lot. And so it's very difficult to control that tear out. It doesn't really matter how sharp your tool is. These tools are very sharp and it still tears out. And it might have something to do with the fact that this is not quarter sawn wood, this is slab sawn wood. But I think it's got more to do with just the fact that the, the curl is just going in every different direction like this. And you start and then you hit a hard spot and it lifts it up and picks that up and tears it out. It's just difficult. You can't just find one direction to carve. So you're constantly working on the direction it's very difficult to carve this smoothly, I can tell you that for sure. But we will get it done, and uh, I've been at it quite a while, and it's going to take quite a while to get further. I mean, it will carve in one direction like this, but then maybe you can see the roughness of that. That's not too bad of tear out, but that's really what you, it amounts to. You just get little chips and nicks tearing out in it. 
difficult, very difficult. Well, I'll just show you what it looks like as I make further progress. My friends, I've come to a stunning revelation on this. And that is, if this had been the very first back I ever carved, if this was the very first one, there probably wouldn't have been a second one. And I'm not exaggerating. This stuff, it's not hard wood. It's not hard wood. The wood is actually softer. I'm telling you, I know for sure the wood is softer. There's no question. The problem is you can't cut it, you can't scrape it, it just tears. Um, I don't know if you can see the fibers. That's after scraping with the fibers. Let me try to get the light where maybe it'll show up there, but the fibers are just, you know, it just, they just tear out. Wow, it's really difficult to get it smooth. And this scraper, I just sharpened it, it's really sharp. And uh, wow. Like I said, if this had been the very first one, there probably wouldn't have been a second. I would not recommend you going, jumping into Luther rebuilding with this material the very first time. Get something else under your belt first, because you will not be happy. I will prevail. It will be fine when I'm done. But getting there ain't easy. It's not terrible, and I think sandpaper will fix the rest of it, but I'm not sure I'm quite there yet either. I'm gonna have to do some more measuring, specific measuring, but you can see I've got a pretty good bowl going on there. And, you know, the thicknesses are getting close, but they're not there yet. I can tell in places, just by moving my hands around, I can tell there's some thick spots. And we'll get all that cleaned up. My friends, I think we almost have a mandolin now. I've went back and double checked my thicknesses and measurements and everything, and everything's real nice. The back, I'll be honest, I think I've heard better sounding backs, perhaps. The back, you know, as I've said before, is only responsible for about 10 to 20 percent of your sound anyway, if that, and I'm giving it a lot of credit at that. The top is really where the sound matters. But this isn't terrible. I've heard, I've actually heard tops on store-bought mandolins that didn't sound this good. It's got some tone, but not a lot. And not, and not a whole lot of sustain. And I'm just being honest, it's just, you know, kind of average on the sound right now. I'm hoping the beauty is gonna make up for that. <laughs> but the top, on the other hand, that's a different story. This top really has the sound, and that's what's important. Try to get the camera up here close so that you can maybe hear the tone. It's hard, and, and now the air conditioning's running too, so I don't know if you'll hear it at all. There's a real tone to that. That long. I can hear it a long time. Really nice tone. Even, clear, just really nice tone. So the top is just wonderful. The back is just kind of average, I guess you'd say, for a back. Nothing super special on the back in terms of sound. But overall, I think we're going to have a winning combination. We're ready now to turn my attention to the sides that I've already built, and we're going to put the kerfing in those sides. So here we go. My friends, I'm about ready to put the kerf in this, and you can see I have dampened it down. That helps it bend a little bit better. It's had time to have most of that moisture gone now, and anyway, it's... Some people say, well, you're diluting the glue, but it really doesn't make that much difference, as long as you don't wet it down a lot. I mean, if you're not just soaking it down. But it does help the kerf bend a little bit better on these tight bends. And we're 
just coating it pretty well. This is not a situation where you really have to be overly concerned about uh, the connection, but you do want a good connection. I just noticed something I haven't done yet. I need to bevel this end right here. Most of the time I bevel it with a Dremel tool, but in this case I think I'll just bevel it with a chisel. And you know, I can't get it all the way across down through there, but that's okay. I can bevel the top here and then whenever I take it apart, I can bevel the rest. And I'm just beveling it You know, just a long bevel just to help the kerf transition. That's good enough. It'll work. In the scheme of things, you can probably hear that violin in the background. And that's old chocolate being played. But by the time you see this video, chocolate will have been aired a long time so it's just to give you an idea of how things fall in the shop here these sides are actually a little bit proud of the blocks I will be running this whole thing through my thickness sander eventually and thinning it all down just a little bit more because it's just a little bit wide at the moment but that'll get everything good and level and make it just perfect the odds are this is probably going to break bending it around this very sharp curve but i'm going to go ahead and soak it down i'm going to spritz it off like this off camera here a little bit and that'll help it a little bit if you get it it's a very very thin piece of wood there on the back and that's what you're softening to make that more flexible and it absorbs the water really quickly because it's so thin and you know you rub it back and forth to work it in and then I'll dry it off with a paper towel to get rid of the surface moisture but by then it's penetrated into the wood pretty well and it should help it bend a little bit better without breaking but more than likely it's still going to break a little bit doesn't really matter too much because you know it's just an angle brace really between the side and the top that's all it is and it doesn't really matter if it's in one piece or in a bunch of pieces but I try to keep it in one piece when I can and this doesn't look like it's gonna flex much at all actually it really looks like it's gonna be a problem this backing on this is a little thicker than some of them I do so it's gonna make it that much harder I'm trying to get it to bend but it's it's not gonna it's not gonna go easy I can tell yeah it's already cracking and breaking that's okay we'll just have to put it in in pieces I'm gonna bevel this off to fit up in this crack a little better my wife is outside the uh, shop window here uh, running the skill saw. <laughs> How many of your wives are out running the skill saw at the moment? But uh, anyway, she, she's got good timing. Whenever the video goes on, she t starts the saw. But uh, I'm making this work. It's, it's not the best. It's a little thick. It's, the, the backing on this is just a little thick for a mandolin, but it'll work. It'll be okay. So now I'm gonna, I know about how long I need it. So I'm gonna cut it off here and bevel that. So I've got glue on here now and I'll spread it out. There goes the skill saw again. My wife is working on some green lumber that she bought from some Amish folks and she's preparing it to dry basically by cutting the ends off and then painting the ends and going to stack it where we have a dehumidifier running. She's wanting to make a rustic table I think.
which means I'll be involved. Hopefully not to a great extent. Okay, we'll let that set while I go to lunch and uh, that'll be fine to work on when I get back. Thank you.